Come on in. Hey, I've been meaning to sort of touch base with you. The last time we met, I introduced you to the idea of the progressive era, the progressive movement, and what might loosely be called progressivism. I told you at the time that what progressivism really involved was the protection of those individuals that simply could not protect themselves. Workers, city dwellers, women, children, right? All of these people were vulnerable to this new world brought to us by industrial capitalism. I don't know if you got this. But in a lot of ways, especially in its early days, progressive act, uh, uh, activism was largely a local issue. Certainly that was the case when it involved the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. That's going to change in this lecture when progressivism begins to kind of dovetail with national reform. There's a very simple explanation for this, and I'll use the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire as an example as to why progressivism will eventually develop into national reform. In the aftermath of the fire, New York City got very serious about um, implementing and then enforcing local ordinances that said you couldn't do things like lock people in their workplace, you had to have fire escapes, there were certain safety precautions that you needed to have. But let's assume for a second that New York does this, and let's further assume that doing this makes it more expensive to do business in New York. Well, what would you do, right? Assuming for a second that you can do business just as effectively in New Jersey, in eastern Pennsylvania, in Massachusetts, neighboring states, of course you would move. You would move to where there's less regulation and consequently lower operating costs to do business. And so even if the entire state of New York says we're going to get serious about this and we're going to enforce all of this, even if all of New York State said that, ultimately you're just going to be chasing these problems around. And so what ends up happening pretty quickly is, is people begin to connect the dots and they begin to understand that if progressive reform is going to mean anything, it's going to need to be the federal government that enacts these policies and ultimately enforces them. Industrial capitalism was a national phenomenon, and if you're going to clean up some of these challenges that are brought to you by industrial capitalism, progressive era reform needed to be a national issue as well. And this is why progressivism and national reform is, is really going to uh, intertwine directly. Right? There's another reason. And the other reason involves some fairly dramatic departures from business as usual. We've talked about socialists in this class before, people that wanted to bring a lot more government regulation, radical forms of government regulation. The ownership of things like railroads and communication companies and what might be loosely described as, um, you know, in industries for for the betterment of the commons. Um, we've talked about Eugene V. Debs. He's probably the most famous socialist politician in the early 20th century. Um, you're looking at him on the PowerPoint slide there if you're following along with me, but he's going to run for president on numerous occasions and he's going to win more than 400,000 votes. Now that's not nearly enough to win the presidency, but that ought to be pretty alarming if you happen to be a Democrat or a Republican. That here's a guy that wants to nationalize the railroads and 400,000 people thought that, that would just be a fine idea. That ought to be a red flag, no pun intended. You also have anarchists, people that wanted to destroy the government altogether. Um, I don't mean destroy it and live in literal anarchy. Um, people like the most famous anarchist that you're looking at there at the bottom of that screen, Emma Goldman, um, felt that really all the government of the United States was, in the late 19th century, was an appendage of people like Andrew Carnegie. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Emma Goldman and um, a lady or a guy that was very close to her, as a matter of fact, they, uh, they were in a relationship at one point in time, Alexander Bergman, um, they actually conspired to assassinate the plant manager at Homestead, Carnegie's Homestead, Henry Frick. 
Now, obviously, they don't succeed in this in 1892, but uh, ultimately, this is going to get them in a lot of trouble with the law. Emma Goldman is going to go on to become a renowned lecturer, uh, lecturing on everything from what might loosely be called feminism to homosexuality to the merits of socialism to a lot of very radical sorts of ideas and concepts in the early 20th century. In the end, she's going to be a victim of what would come to be known as the Red Scare, and she will be deported um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the early 1920s. But that's another story for another class. The last group that I'd like to talk about would be another group that we've discussed in this class before, the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World. We know that these individuals are in the process of trying to build one gigantic global union to strike all at the same time and cripple world governments. They're actually having a bit of success. They're, they're, they're recruiting like gangbusters. And one reason why is it's not simply unionism, as in pure and simple unionism, I want better pay, I want a shorter workday, that sort of thing. In many ways, the IWW is a leading institution for what you and I would call civil rights. It's the IWW that's standing up for African American rights when it comes to some of these logging companies on the West Coast. It's the IWW that is standing for equal pay for equal work in various other industries throughout the United States. But all of these individuals, all of these groups and organizations, they're attracting a pretty significant following, or at least by the standards of how radical they were, there's a lot of people that are focused on them and actually listening to what they have to say. So what that means, guys, if you happen to be a mainstream Republican, if you happen to be a rank-and-file Democrat, you better pay attention to the issues that they're bringing up, because if you don't, it might be these guys that get to address these issues, if you understand what I mean. One individual that gets this message loud and clear is a very unlikely person, but he's going to become a very important person in the 20th century, and that would be future President Theodore Roosevelt. A little bit of background on Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt came not only from a very wealthy family, but a very old money family. His ancestors had come over in the period in which the Dutch, uh, people from Holland, were colonizing uh, the New World, what would become New York State. And they went into um, various forms of business, really, but ultimately, a lot of their wealth was derived from the land. In a way, you could look at the Roosevelts as an American aristocracy in the sense that their wealth was coming from the land that they owned. They were old, old money. And this is before, you know, politics was what you and I think of it as. Roosevelt was not encouraged when he said that he wanted to go into politics. It was not something that people that were well-to-do generally did, and he didn't get a whole lot of um, encouragement from his family. He would later go to Harvard University, and he would develop a passion for not only the law, but also politics. And he's really going to get his big break when he's named as the fire commissioner of New York City in 1896. Now, 1896, New York was suffering of a drought, right? High temperatures. And although it doesn't get like Texas hot or even California hot in New York, there's an enormous amount of concrete which serves as more or less radiators. And if you don't have any kind of regulation in some of these apartments and some of these factories, you're just asking for something bad to happen. And Roosevelt knew that. And so what he begins to do as the fire commissioner is he begins to tell some of these slumlords, listen, you either put a window in your apartment, you either put a ventilation system so the air moves, or I'm going to come and shut you down. You will break fire code, and I will shut you down, and, and you'll, you'll lose money. Now, this does not make him any friends in New York City. As a matter of fact, he's pretty well hated in New York. And it's not just by landlord. It's by everybody that can see the potential damage that he could do if this brand of politics catches, uh, catches on. But in upstate New York, Teddy Roosevelt is becoming an absolute political rock star, okay? 
As a matter of fact, as the 19th century comes to a close, the name Roosevelt begins to be, you know, tossed around in political circles all throughout the country. He's becoming the face of the Republican Party. Now, there's a problem, and that problem is internally within the Republican Party. If you recall, William McKinley was the guy that's going to win the election of 1896. And a big reason for that is because people like Carnegie and Rockefeller got behind him financially as well as politically. And when he got to Washington, he certainly was not one of these reform-oriented politicians, let alone reform-oriented Republicans. And so you've got a guy that's in the White House at the time, the face of the party, uh, confronted with this up-and-coming rock star of a politician. What do you do? Well, if you're McKinley, what you do in 1900 is you make him your vice presidential running mate. Teddy Roosevelt is going to become William McKinley's running mate. And this, at least momentarily for McKinley, gives him the best of both worlds. If you liked uh, Theodore Roosevelt, then vote for me. He's my vice president. If you like me, vote, vote for me, clearly. you know, It's the best of both worlds. But similar to Abraham Lincoln in 1864, he didn't think anything ever was going to happen to him that was in any way bad. And of course it does. Less than a year after being re-elected, William McKinley is assassinated by a radical, a guy by the name of Leon Solzig, who would, would, would kill McKinley, and it's going to make Teddy Roosevelt president of the United States. Now, Keep in mind, there were people within the Republican Party, conservatives, that did not like this whole idea of regulating the economy, telling apartment owners that they had to put windows or ventilation systems in, leave business alone was their mantra. They had been worried about this because you were putting Roosevelt, this reform-minded Republican, one heartbeat away from the presidency. And now, he here, and now here he is right in the White House. Your worst nightmare has come true. And it was not for no good reason that they worried. Roosevelt is quickly going to establish a reputation of being uh, anti-monopolistic. As a matter of fact, his nickname is going to become the trust buster, the monopoly breaker. Okay. One thing that I want to point out before we go any further I do not want you to get the idea that Roosevelt was somehow anti-capitalism. He wasn't even anti-big business. He felt that America needed big business for a lot of different reasons, but he also felt strongly that, 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 that big business needed to play by a set of rules, and it should be the federal government that enforced those rules. Think of it this way. I think what Roosevelt was saying was the federal government would essentially play the role of a referee. And any time a company, a corporation, or what have you stepped out of bounds or broke the rules, the government would call them on it, and if they didn't clean up their act, the government would punish them. A very good case in point is going to be an early incident that would test his mettle involving the Northern Securities Company. The Northern Securities Company was a massive, monolithic railroad monopoly. It didn't get much more poster child than Northern. When it comes to a monopoly, it was owned and operated by investment banker J.P. Morgan. And what Roosevelt is going to do is he's going to order Morgan to break Northern Securities apart as it violated federal anti-monopolistic laws. And Morgan, who at this point in time had become very accustomed to the government working for him and not the other way around, basically says, I don't know if you know who you're talking about or who you're talking to here. And Roosevelt says, no, I think I, 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 I really do. And he sues him in federal court and he wins. The federal court system determined that Northern Securities was in fact a monopoly and the court system ordered it to be broken apart. Northern Securities was one of the biggest, most powerful, richest companies in the world. It was brought to its knees by Teddy Roosevelt, and all of a sudden, household names started getting in line when it comes to complying with his brand of reform. Everybody from U.S. Steel to American Tobacco to uh, uh, American Motors, they, they all began to line up because nobody wanted to go to court and, and 
potentially suffer the same fate as Morgan and Northern Securities did. This is what really earns Teddy Roosevelt not only the nickname Trust Buster, but in a lot of ways, the favor and the enthusiasm, the passions of the American people. In 1904, um, Roosevelt is going to run for uh, president for the first time. You know, he, he's he's inherited that uh, that title. Keep in mind, he he served more than four years. Excuse me, more than three years um, as the inheritor of McKinley's presidency. This is the first time he's actually eligible. And what you're going to see is Roosevelt implement something that comes to be known as the square deal. What's unique about a square? Well, it's got four equal sides. The square deal is a deal driving at equality for the American people. That what the federal government will do is serve as that role as enforcer of the rules. Uh, they will make sure that everybody has fairness and opportunity in the marketplace, and if they get out of line, the government will hold them accountable. What you see through the square deal years from 1804, excuse me, 1904 to 1908, is a series of laws that are designed to implement exactly that, right? The Meat Quality and Inspection Act. It enforced quality standards in the meatpacking industry. Um, it didn't clean it up entirely, if you understand what I mean, but it was infinitely better. The stuff that you could and could not put in food um, improved under Roosevelt. The Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906. This regulated um, what you could sell to American consumers, and it had to pass the litmus test of the federal government before it could go on sale on American shelves. The Keating Owen Act um, didn't completely eliminate, but it certainly curbed the use of child labor. Um, there's an environmentalism aspect to this as well. Roosevelt was a great outdoorsman, um, really felt that the outdoors was vital to building himself up. And as I insinuated in a couple earlier lectures, there's going to be some naturalists, John Muir in particular, that get in Roosevelt's ear and, and tell him of the need to protect the environment. Keep in mind, progressivism is provi providing protection for those people that can't protect themselves. Well, the environment's not a person, but it certainly can't protect itself from industrial capitalism, and Roosevelt is going to provide that protection, both in the Forest Service Act as well as the National Park Service. What these laws are going to do is place thousands and thousands of federally owned acres of land under the protection of the federal government. Don't care how much money you can make by drilling here, you're not going to drill for oil here, right? Now, in 1908, Roosevelt has been serving for almost two back-to-back -back terms. And he says, I've, I've really done about as much as I can do. I've certainly done a lot of good, and I've got this progressive ball rolling. I'm done. He more or less does not run for what really would have been his third term, but only his second official term. Before he goes, though, he hand-selects the guy that's going to take the reins from him, his one-time friend, William Howard Taft. Now, Taft is a progressive, but he's not as progressive as Roosevelt, if you understand what I mean. Furthermore, the big advantage that Teddy Roosevelt had was friendly majorities in both houses of Congress, the House and the Senate. Taft is not going to have that. Now, half the Republican Party believed in what Teddy Roosevelt was doing, referred to themselves as progressives, and half really hated him for what he was doing, right? Your more conservative Republican quote-unquote insurgents, had really won majorities the same year that Taft was inaugurated president, and they pretty much hit the brakes when it comes to exactly what he's going to be able to do. In short, you don't see that flurry of regulation laws that Roosevelt was able to get passed. What's more is that Taft essentially let a dirty little secret out of the bag when it comes to Teddy Roosevelt. Obviously, he's taking a lot of guff. Why can't you be the president that TR was? 
And he says, you know something, TR was not what he was cracked up to be. There's a lot of things that you don't know about Roosevelt, including the gentleman's agreement that he had with some of these great big industries, probably most famously U.S. Steel. He didn't go in there and, you know, take names, so to speak. He simply said, let's get on the same page, address X, Y, and Z, and we'll call it good. But it's not like he just went in there and started making demands. Roosevelt, who at this point in time, as the avid hunter that he was, had gone on this African safari, was infuriated when he heard that Taft had let that secret out. He stormed all the way back to Washington, where he demanded that he be put on the Republican ticket for the election of 1912 and Taft be taken down. The Republicans, who, again, by now, the more conservative wing of the party is reigning supreme, they turn him down flat. They say, no, we're very happy with Taft, and we don't want you, and thanks for all we've done, right? Roosevelt's not a guy that hears no very easily. It's what he does is he starts his own organization, what would come to be known as the Progressive Party, or the Progressive Bull Moose Party. Um, the Progressive Party is going to have at its central core platform the idea of new nationalism, right? What Teddy Roosevelt described as new nationalism was the federal government expanding on the square deal. What Roosevelt essentially says in 1912 is, why should the government just stop as the referee? The government ought to be the guarantor of a specific well-being for the American people. In short, new nationalism was driving at the idea that the federal government would not allow people to sink below a certain level of subsistence in American life. It would go beyond enforcing minimums and uh, maximums when it comes to workplace safety. Um, it, it would actually guarantee a minimum level of existence in American life. Right? Now, for all intents and purposes, what you've got in 1912 are two Republicans running against one Democrat. And any time you begin to split the party, you, you really give that other party, in this case the Democrats, a huge advantage in the election. And that's exactly what happens in 1912. The guy that you're looking at there on the slide, that, that's, uh, that's, that, that's Woodrow Wilson, who is a Democrat, right? He is a Democrat, but he's also a progressive. I told you, you didn't have to be a Republican to be a progressive. Wilson's a Democrat, but he's a progressive. He's a different kind of progressive, but he's a progressive all the same. Um, Wilson is going to see Teddy Roosevelt's new nationalism, and he's going to raise what he calls new freedom. Now, although Wilson shared many of the principles and the ideas of Teddy Roosevelt when it comes to getting big business in order, what Wilson felt was the real enemy was bigness of any variety. Big business, yep, that's a problem, but big government is every bit as much of a problem. And so what New Freedom drove at was the idea that they were going to scale down the size of everything, right? Break apart some of these monopolies and make big business smaller, but break down government as well. Because when government gets too big and too micromanaging, ultimately that's going to erode freedoms, liberty, and you name it, right? Wilson will go on to win this election. And for the first time in a long, long time, you're going to have a Democrat in the White House. It's not going to be the meatpacking industry that Wilson is going to come after. He's going to come after the financial industry. We're talking about a time period where investment bankers, people like J.P. Morgan, are more or less allowed to do whatever they feel necessary when it comes to the products that they offer, the practices that they implement, and the consequences that those are going to have for the American economy. And one of the things that Wilson is going to do is he's going to establish what you and I call the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve does a lot of things, but what's probably most important that it does is it implements what economists call fiscal policy. When you have a recession, right, times are tough. The basic problem is you've got um, not enough dollars chasing too many goods. You want people to go out there and start buying things. That's what you want. And so in this case, what the Federal Reserve will do is lower the interest rate, 
it'll lower the amount of interest that banks can legally charge in the hopes that more people see this as a good opportunity to take out a loan on a home or a car or something or along those lines. At the same time, when you've got an inflationary time period, there's too many dollars chasing around too few goods, what the government will do, what the Federal Reserve will do, will raise interest rates, right? And you see this very periodically throughout our, our, our history, including today, right? Anyway, what this is essentially doing is it's telling people like Andrew, uh, well, um, people like J.P. Morgan, how they can and cannot run their banks. And so it's an element of the progressive era in the sense that it's providing protection to the American consumers and is really targeting the financial industry when it comes to cleaning things up. Wilson's generally going to be the last of the progressive presidents. Um, in the aftermath of Woodrow Wilson, you, you, you're really going to see a return to conservatism. You might even say laissez-faire approaches to governing um, by the 1920s. Now, in a lot of ways, World War I has a big part to play in that, and you'll understand what I mean once we get there. But one thing I want to leave you with is that you still have these lingering problems, and some of the most some of the biggest problems involve the lingering labor question, right? Um, you still have workers that are trying to form unions, and you still have companies that are violently repressing their efforts to form them. A um, very good example, in a bad way, of what I'm talking about would be the Ludlow Massacre um, in Ludlow, Colorado. Ludlow was a mining town. It was a petro uh, petroleum, gasoline, refinery mining town, but it was owned and operated by our good friend John D. Rockefeller. And the workers had gone out on strike, and um, the, the, the company hired this organization known as the Pinkerton Detective Agency, who was known for its strike-breaking capabilities, uh, getting workers into line, so to speak. And these Pinkertons essentially attacked the miners and burned down a huge chunk of their town, killing innocent women and children in the process. And so when I say you've got some lingering problems, even as late as the Progressive Era, there's no more vivid example than what you're seeing there at Ludlow, right? You also have a growing federal bureaucracy. You're beginning to see the federal government getting bigger and bigger. And keep in mind, guys, what I asked you in quiz one, what I asked you on the first day of class, I'll come back to that again and again and again. Are we freer today than when our class begins in 1877? And one of the things that the progressive era is known for is, is its centrality, its, its importance as to how we live our lives as Americans today. Um, today, we think about the federal government uh, in a way that is very different than when class begins in 1877. When the economy is bad, we generally look to the federal government. Um, when, when fuel prices are too high, we generally look to the federal government. When there's a crisis involving civil rights or education or foreign policy, federal government. A big reason as to why is the, is the progressive era. This is when you begin to see the federal government really begin to take on some of these big national problems or at least question marks very, very directly. Did not really see that up until this point, right? Um, it's also going to be a period where we begin to see the growth of the federal government. You're beginning to see some of these federal agencies, these offices, if you will. They're beginning to get bigger and bigger and bigger. They're beginning to get more and more powerful, have more and more authority. And maybe most challenging of all, they're they're requiring more and more money, more and more taxpayer money to, to run. And ultimately, a lot of scholars is going to trace some of the issues that we have today involving these challenges with the federal government, trace them back to the progressive era. And so this is why the progressive era, the early 20th century, is such an important time period in American history. Now, the last stage of the Progressive Era is, is really going to come via World War I. And although you won't see what I mean the next time we talk, you'll certainly begin to see the building blocks of World War I when we examine American foreign policy. And that's what, uh, that's what we will begin with the next time I see you.